Hey everybody, Laura here. I share travel and hiking content and as you've probably recently seen, I just posted a video on the Australian Alps walking track, which I completed solo from the ACT through New South Wales and Victoria. It is a through hike which runs approximately 700 kilometers and I've been receiving a lot of really great questions from you guys about it. So I thought I'd sit down today and do a bit of a gear rundown. Uh, talk to you about some of the things that I really love to take with me when I'm out there and as well answer some of your questions to do with through hiking, overnight hiking and the AAWT in particular. So before I jump straight into it, if you're new here, a quick introduction about me. I've been traveling Australia for the last few years. A little over a year ago, started multi-day hiking and quickly fell in love with it. I've since done longer distance trails like the Bibliman Track in Western Australia and more recently the Australian Alps Walking Track here on the east coast. I've also done plenty of shorter but multi-day trails like the Lara Pinta in the NT, Great Ocean Walk in Victoria or shorter stuff like down in Wilson's Prom. So I've learned a lot along the way and I hope I can share a little bit of that with you guys. All right, so jumping straight into a gear breakdown, this is specifically what I carried for the month that I was on the Australian Alps walking track. So the pack I went with was the North Face Women's Pack. It's 55 litres. It's been with me right around Australia. It's seen months quite literally on trail and it's holding up really, really well. It's by no means an ultralight pack, but I feel that it fits my body as a smaller frame really nicely. Unfortunately, I didn't quite get to do a a full pack weight before I started as I had driven down there to jump on the trail but I believe my base weight was sitting about the 10 kilo mark before food and water. Now that definitely does not classify as ultralight hiking but for myself I found it quite manageable and I had everything that I need to feel safe and prepared to be on trail. There's obviously so much variation and options to choose from when it comes to pack but as a starting point I think the 55 litre is a really great size when you don't have ultralight really small gear and you are going for a longer period. You obviously can go bigger but the bigger you go probably the more weight you're going to be tempted to carry. To go with my pack I also carried a pack cover. It's from Mountain Warehouse. It's pretty generic but it's hard wearing and it's been with me again right around Australia. Jumping into my camping and sleep setup, the tent I went with for the Australian Alps walking track is the Stormbreak North Face 1. It is a one man freestanding backpacking tent. I bought it specifically last year for the Bibliman track over in Western Australia. And if that doesn't mean much to you, basically a freestanding tent is one that you can put up without having to peg it down. It's really, really helpful in places like the Bib where you're often camping on platforms or in shelters, but trying to get away from the mosquitoes. So it wasn't super relevant to the Australian Alps walking track, but I did feel it was quick and easy to set up and it handled the conditions really, really well. Whilst I would recommend this tent, I think for myself personally in future, if I'm not doing anything where I rely on platforms, I may look at getting something lighter. My sleeping mat is the Mountain Designs Airlight Insulated Mat. It is my second through hike with this mat. It also did the bib with me. I'm really impressed with this one with how tough and durable it is considering what it's been through. However, I have recently upgraded to the women's Etherlite insulated mat purely because it's a better size for me. I found my original mat to be a bit too long for reference. I'm about 165 centimeters tall and it was just a little bit bulky for what I needed. That said, I haven't been using the Etherlite for too long, so I will be interested to see how it handles. I have also previously used self-inflating sleeping mats and I personally just wouldn't recommend them as they're too bulky for what you actually get out of them. Instead of a sleeping bag for the Alps track, I actually went with a quilt. It was my first through hike using a quilt and I was really, really impressed with it. The particular one I took was the Waratah quilt by Neve Gear. It is very small, lightweight and packable. And I really loved that I could use it as a blanket when I was sitting up on top of rocks or on verandas watching the sunrise or set. I had a few questions about whether it was warm enough in these conditions for me. Now, personally, I'm a really cold sleeper, so I opted to also take a sleeping bag liner, which was a good choice for me. But it will obviously add that little bit of pack weight if you choose to take it. 
Now that I'm down in Tasmania, I have reverted back to a sleeping bag just because the temperatures are that much colder at the moment. Probably quite similar to what you would see in the winter months of the AAWT or with worse weather than what I had. The bag I'm using is the Women's Down Sleeping Bag in the Cedar Summit Spark series and I've been really, really impressed with it so far. As for a pillow, I normally choose to go without one. I actually like to shovel my spare clothes in a dry bag and use that as a pillow. It's not much extra weight, but if you do want to carry one, the Cedar Summit range I think are also really good quality. For my cooking setup, I use the Jet Boil. I use it religiously. I've had it for probably a couple of years. Once again, it's been around Australia. It's been on the bib. It's been on the Larapenta. It's been on the Overland track. Came with me right through the Alps and it's done really, really well. I love cooking with it. Obviously to use it, you do have to carry a gas canister. I went with the 230 gram gas canister over the smaller light 100 gram gas canister. There really isn't much way to resupply gas while you're out on trail unless you've got someone dropping things to you. I used it pretty sparingly or just as I needed to to cook and make hot coffees and drinks each day and it got me pretty much through the whole month but I had nothing left at the end. As well for my cooking setup I carry a spoon and fork, I personally like to take a tea towel, I carry a cup with me and then double the jet boil as my bowl or there's a cup on the bottom which is actually used to measure but you can use that as a bowl as well. Hand in hand with cooking, we obviously have drinking water. This is super important for all hiking, particularly through hiking in the AAWT, where you will have to both find and collect and filter all your own water for the duration of the track. So in this instance, I decided to use the Catadine Be Free bottle and filter. I had heard really, really good reviews about it. I was actually quite impressed with it until a few weeks in, I ended up getting a very small hole in the bottle and had to patch it. I have no idea what actually caused the hole and I was a bit disappointed, I guess because I was hoping it would be a bit tougher considering this is specifically what it is designed for. I personally haven't tried the Life Straw filters, however if you are a Life Straw user, my understanding is the Catadine Be Free is a very similar option, it was just what I was recommended prior to starting by other through hikers. I did find it was possibly a little bit slow to filter water, but that's just part of the experience being out there. And I will mention as well on previous hikes like the Bibliman Track where you do have access to water tanks where you might have contaminated water but you're not necessarily filtering things out, I have used aqua tabs in that instance and find them to work really well as well. A few people did question why I would even be filtering or treating this beautiful clear creek water when I was out on the Australian Alps walking track and the answer is there is a very high population of feral animals out there like brumbies and dogs, dingoes, all sorts, even possums on on the roofs of the huts and you just don't want to risk getting sick when you really don't need to. Obviously to filter or not is your choice but that is what I would recommend doing and I believe how I didn't end up sick during the duration. Okay let's talk hiking clothes. This is a little bit controversial but I really like to hike in activewear. I find it super comfortable. I know most people though will tell you to wear baggier loose fitting clothes. It will protect you from vegetation and also from snakes but again just do what feels right for you and what you're comfortable and safe in. For this particular trail being a month long with very varied condition, I took four sets of clothing. I took a warm weather set, which was basically an active wear set, top and bottom, a sun shirt, hat and sunnies. I took a cold weather set, which was a long active wear set, a jacket and beanie. I then took a set of thermals and a set of rain gear. My rain gear was the Marmot pants, which were perfect to me, and also the Patagonia rain jacket, which I was really, really impressed with this time. Some people might tell you that is way too much clothing. Others will tell you that's not enough at all for a month. But again, it's what worked really well for me. When it comes to shoes, I tried so many pairs before I started. I was really tossing up whether to go with a jogger or a boot. And this is really just a case of trial and error. I ended up landing on the Women's Ultra Lone Peak 7 and was so, so happy with them. They have a really wide toe box, which is what made the difference for me and really stopped me ending up with blisters between my toes, which has happened on previous hikes. There's also an awful lot of water crossings on this trail. So for me, it was really important to have a shoe that could dry quickly and was super breathable whilst also protecting my feet. 
being a lighter weight shoe other than a boot i did add a gel inner sole which again i think made a really big difference to the comfort of my feet walking for that almost 700 kilometers and i will note that they don't have a lot of ankle support but for me personally, that wasn't an issue. If that is something for you, I would probably stay clear. For socks, I went with Injinji toe socks. I swear by Injinji. I didn't get, I think, a single blister the entire duration of the Australian Alps track. So I would recommend a sock liner if you're wearing something that's a little bit of a bigger fit or a thicker toe sock if you're wearing a shoe like I was out on trail. And then pair this with some gaiters as well if you're walking through thicker vegetation. You don't want anything to end up in your shoes and it'll help protect you from snakes at the same time. I carried toiletries and a toilet kit, which is exactly what you would expect, including things like your toothbrush, sunscreen, and trowel. I carried a first aid kit, which I would 100% recommend you carry on any hike, whether you are headed out for a day, a week, or a month and longer. It's probably one of the most important things that you're going to have with you. You don't have to go too crazy with this. Just make sure you have all the basic essentials plus a snake bandage at the very minimum. For me, some extras that I throw in, a pen is really helpful, particularly if you have trail logbooks to sign. Pen always seems to be missing, so it's a good indicator of where you've been if you can write it down. And medical scissors, it's a tiny bit of extra weight, but the amount of random uses I've had for them has been really helpful, as well as obviously if you need to cut up gauze or medical tape if something happens. On the note of safety, I always walk with a PLB. This is a personal locator beacon. I did meet other people on the trail carrying a Garmin inReach. I've never tried one, so I can't talk on that in particular, but as a solo hiker, the PLB is an essential for me and I'd really recommend group hikes do carry them as well. A few extras that I had, I carried a head torch, obviously. I went with a Signet power bank. I've tried a few different ones. I really relied on power and had very limited access to power this trail while filming. So that was really good. I carried charging cords for my phone and head torch a compass, the Chapman's guidebook, and then packed everything into dry bags. This is a bit of a messy photo of all the gear I took for this particular hike in my parents' living room before I left for Canberra. When it comes to actually getting your food, it's obviously not super realistic to be carrying sometimes a month or even upwards of a month's worth of food with you, which is where resupply comes into place. On some trails, you will actually walk through towns frequently enough that you can just pick up a resupply and whatever you need from the shops as you go. However, in the case of trails like the Australian Alps walking track, which are quite remote, the only towns for the duration that you will walk past are Threadbow and Hotham. There are a few further out, but these are really the only two that you could reliably walk to. For this reason, many hikers choose to place food boxes before their hike does come with a few drawbacks. Firstly, being that you obviously have to take the time to walk or drive out there to place them before you start. And secondly, you have to come back after you finish and recollect the boxes. You also can't place a lot of fresh stuff because it just won't be any good by the time you get there. Next, I wanna talk about food because let's be honest, nutrition is such a big part of hiking and through hiking in particular. It's something that's going to take a lot of planning and I think in my opinion, a bit of getting used to and working out what your body particularly craves. I know for myself on trail, when I'm walking for a long period of time, I start to really want sugar. So I know to include something like a block of chocolate that my body obviously really wants. Yet I've spoken to other hikers who say they've been out for a few days and the only thing they want is salt and they can't imagine eating chocolate. So I'd really recommend if you get the opportunity to go out for a couple of days and figure out what works right for you before jumping into something longer and packing massive amounts of food that you might not actually want at the end of the day. When it comes to what to pack, there's no right and wrong answer. Everyone's gonna want something different. I will note though, if you're going on a shorter hike, you're gonna have much more ability to carry more fresh food, or I should say shorter durations between resupply even, because if you're carrying two days, three days worth of food, it's obviously a bigger weight limit that you can add to your pack compared to if you're going for a week and you have to carry a week's worth of food, it has to be pretty light stuff that you're taking with you. So if I'm going for overnight, I'll obviously chuck in something like an apple. You might be able to bring something like a wrap with you, all that good fresh stuff. 
but it does have to be limited when you're going for longer durations. This is where dehydrated and packaged food comes in. I know that doesn't sound super healthy, but you do have to get the calories into your body and it does have to be things that you physically can take with you without refrigeration, that are light enough and can be cooked on something simply like a jet boil or even cold soaked just with water. For me, some examples of things that I took on the Australian Alps walking track are oats for porridge, which I had every morning, dried fruit like dates, sultanas, apples, any of those good things. I took a variety of muesli bars because I guarantee if you take the same thing for that long, you're going to get sick of it. Uh, biscuits, again, variety of sweet and savory, whatever you like, it's just easy to store and doesn't matter basically how long it sits in your backpack. Lollies, uh, things like lolly snakes are perfect, really good for energy and they don't melt in hot weather, which is a bonus. Nuts like almonds and cashews, soy crisps I particularly love. Uh, seaweed is actually really good for salt and something that I've introduced to my hiking diet. Chocolate, obviously, noodles, rice and continental soups are really great. If you are able to make your own dehydrated meals before you head out on trail, not only will it be a good way to help save money, but you'll also be able to completely control what you put in your food, which could be really important if you have dietary requirements. It can be important though if you're traveling to your trail, for instance domestically or even internationally, there's certain things that you can and can't take across borders, so make sure whatever you're cooking for yourself, you're labeling it really well and check before you go to all the effort of doing that. Because I am pretty much constantly on the road, I tend to go with a pre-packaged dehydrated meal. My go-to is actually a company called Campers Pantry, which are based down here in Tasmania. They are my choice purely because they have really good real ingredients in them. And if you're not super familiar with backpacking food and trying to get into it, my biggest recommendation to you would be to actually flip over the packaging, have a bit of a read of the ingredients, and if anything on it looks really concerning to you, maybe consider if that's the brand you want to go with. Obviously, try a few things, get some variety in there, and see what you like for when you're out on trail. In addition to food, I like to take hot drinks, especially in cold climates. I'll go with a coffee sachet, a hot chocolate sachet, and obviously carry electrolytes with me as well. These here are a couple of my favorites. My AAWT planning would probably be considered quite short and last minute. I think probably about a month out, I started considering the hike and then did all my planning in that little couple of weeks before I jumped onto the trail. A big factor contributing to that for me was the fact that both Kosciuszko and Alpine National Park this hiking season have major aerial shooting closures, which wouldn't actually allow me to get in and place food drops or collect them after, or even make it through the open window if I didn't go when I did. Obviously, I could have completed the trail in sections around the closures, but I really wanted to do an end-to-end. -end. I also don't have any family in the area, so I couldn't rely on them to meet me at road access points to check in and give me food. So my alternative was basically to use the post offices in Threadbo and Hotham. I organized all of my food into parcels before I left and from home up in northern New South Wales, addressed these to the post offices and sent them down. I'm not sure if people are aware they can do this. You can simply write on it um, specifically to be collected by a hiker for the bib track, for the Alps track, for whatever trail you're doing and address it to the post office asking them to hold it for you. I did also want to support these stores so I tried to stock up on things like fresh fruit or any extras I might need when I got to the towns but these are very small alpine villages you have to keep in mind this is not like going to Woolies or Coles so you're gonna have to send the bulk of what you need with you. This actually ended up being really really convenient for me because I did obviously make it through the time window that I had and I didn't have to worry about coming back after to collect those empty boxes. If I was however to do the trail again in future I probably would take on the extra planning time and make sure to get out to place at least a box or two for two reasons. Firstly being by the end of the hike I was doing fine but I would have really enjoyed a little bit of extra food that I just wasn't carrying to keep my weight down and two if the weather had have been worse or I had have taken longer for unforeseen circumstances I would have put myself in a position where I probably would have had to ration food and that's not ideal when you're out there particularly alone and for such a long period of time. 
ultimately for the trail I ended up carrying about nine days worth of food from the start through to Threadbow. I carried I think it was 10 from Threadbow through to Hotham and another 10 from Hotham to the end of the trail. This is a massive amount of food and weight. It made the trail possible for me. Whether that's something you'd consider yourself is totally up to you. I think it's worth noting as well this is something I had done before when I walked the Lara Pinta in the Northern Territory. I carried 11 days worth of food to complete it without a resupply so I knew it was something that I was capable of doing and was confident going into attempting basically. Next up is navigation. The AAWT is quite a remote long distance through hike so there are a few options you can use here. I personally went digital and hard copy just to have the backup in case anything went wrong. Starting digital I went with the Far Out app. I want to point out it's not always accurate so I would not be completely reliant on it. There were a number of points where the trail where it said differed quite a lot actually from where the marked AAWT went or where I followed roads but it was a really good reference. Um, a bonus to it, it does also let you see the trail notes of other hikers which is really good on more popular trails for things like trail condition and finding water points. Because the AAWT is not a super busy trail there wasn't unfortunately a lot to work with here but it can be an added bonus to get that sort of information while you're out there. As for a hard copy, I went with the Chapman's guidebook. This might just be the single best resource you can find for the Australian Alps walking track. It is great for finding water points and it is also fairly up to date with the latest maps and directions for each individual section of the Australian Alps walking track. In addition to this, you can obviously get topographical maps for each area that you'll be walking through and I also made sure to carry a compass. Realistically, even though this trail is remote and is not always marked, it does have a fair bit of road walking. There are some sections with lots of arrows and if you have a good sense of direction, I'm sure you'll get the hang of it pretty quickly and be completely fine out there. Next up, power. I didn't have any rest days and didn't stay in any towns, which meant for me the only power I had for the entire month was what I was carrying with me. I ended up going with a Signet 20,000 amp hour power bank and was actually pretty happy with it. It lasts quite a while given that you use it sparingly, but I did use it for navigation, obviously using maps on my phone. I used it to film the video that you guys have recently watched. I used it to check in with family and friends and have it charging up my phone basically in case of emergency as well as charging my head torch. I don't know of a single power bank that is going to last you a month however so when I did pick up my food resupply at Threadbow and at Hotham I posted myself with my food a new power bank collected that one and posted the dead one back to home or to wherever I could pick it up from. I forgot to mention in my actual video of the trail, the distances that I displayed on the screen, I hadn't recorded myself because I had such limited access to power. Those were taken directly from the Chapman's guidebook. I also had a few questions about elevation. Again, I didn't record this because of the lack of power. However, based off the Far Out app and the Chapman's guidebook, I understand the trail in completion to have about 31,000 meters of ascent and a similar number of descent. At my pace of 28 days this does obviously mean you're averaging over a thousand meters of elevation per day. Which direction should you walk? The trail can be walked either Nobo or Sobo which in through hiking terms quite literally means northbound or southbound and I think the trail would be quite interesting either way. I personally walked north to south purely to make it through the trail's closure dates on the northern end and this meant that I ended up doing most of my elevation and tougher days at the end of the hike. I think if I had the option I would choose to walk south to north to get most of the tougher days out of the way while I'm feeling fresh on trail. However, if you are not so confident or want to start slowly, I would say walk south to north, build up some trail fitness and progress as you go. Another thing worth noting is the directions in the Chapman's guidebook are written for a northbound hike. So if you like to follow directions, then that might be a better way to go for you. Where can you get up-to-date trail information? 
Unfortunately, because the trail walks through the ACT, New South Wales and Victoria, as well as a bunch of different parks and wilderness areas, information seems to be all over the place and no one seems to talk to each other. My best advice to you would be to call the information centres directly in the areas you plan to go through. So for instance, I called the Namaji Visitor Centre before starting and spoke to them about conditions in the ACT. They'll be able to tell you what's going on directly in their parks. It's also a good idea to go onto the national parks websites, go onto each one individually, scroll down, look through all the notifications for upcoming closures and see if there's anything that might affect you. It's also a good idea to join the Australian Alps Walking Track Facebook page. That way you can give information to other hikers and they can help you likewise. Is it safe to walk alone? Now, I might be a bit biased here, but I'd say, yeah, absolutely go for it. I went out there on my own, had such a great time and had a really great experience with it. That said, you should still go prepared, be aware of the conditions, be aware of what you need to take with you and note that there are risks associated with walking solo. It's always beneficial to have people with you in case someone gets injured or something goes wrong, but it's nice to rely on yourself and challenge yourself that way as well. A few things to be aware of for anyone, but particularly if you're heading out solo, there are a large number of snakes in this area. You have to be super vigilant, like I said, carry a snake bandage with you. There are areas which are very prone to night hunting, which you definitely need to be aware of aside from the actual aerial shooting closures. There might not be many other people on the trail, so you need to be comfortable with being alone. There were many nights and many days in a row where I wouldn't see anyone at all. And there are also sections or the majority of the trail actually with very limited to no phone reception. So you really need to be carrying that PLB with you. Can I share my itinerary? This has been a question from a few people and yes, absolutely. I'm more than happy to do that. So I'll pop a link to it in the description below. I just wanna say though, this is the itinerary for what I ended up doing. It won't necessarily work for everyone, but it should give you a really good starting point for what 28 days can look like. Do keep in mind that these distances I walked in really good weather with very little going wrong. Most people would also choose something closer to a six week itinerary. So if you're basing anything off that, just allow yourself a bit of extra time. It is also quite a big time commitment. So you might even want to look into doing just sections or completing a sectional end to end of the trail. One last thing I want to touch on is transport. Even at the start and the end of the trail, these areas could be considered remote and there is no transport or very limited transport options. Ideally, to jump on this trail, you'll have someone who can give you a lift to the start and pick you up from the end. However, if this is not an option, you are able, like myself, to leave a car at the Namaji Visitor Centre out from Canberra. For the duration of the hike, they will lock up the car park at night and it should be pretty safe there. There is a Track Angel group and a Facebook page you can join who are really, really supportive of walkers on the hike. If you get in contact with them, they should be able to pick you up, depending on their availability, at the other end when you finish in Walhalla. There is no public transport whatsoever from Walhalla, so you're gonna have to tee something up if you don't have family or friends there. From here, like myself, if you plan on getting back to Canberra, you need to make your way to either Taralgon or Mo, and I'm gonna pop a link below as well for a bus timetable so that you know what days it runs on and when you can get yourself back there. Once you reach Canberra, you can get a taxi back out to the visitor center, or personally, I was really lucky to have Trail Angels help me out there as well. Hopefully that gives you a bit of a better idea of my gear and what's going on with this trail. There is a lot to consider when it comes to through hiking from what to eat, what to pack, and even how to plan your days. But it is a really fun experience and something that I'm really excited to see more people getting into. If you do have any more questions for me, feel free to drop them below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can there. However, that is all for me today. So I do thank you for joining me and I look forward to sharing more adventures soon.